today's topic is obviously good heart health. That's why we're here today. Um, so just to start off, I should first and foremost please understand that this is educational purposes only. This is not replacing anything that your doctor or healthcare provider may tell you. It's just another viewpoint. Okay. So for those of you who weren't here last week, um, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Kim Thompson. I'll throw all this up here so you have it. Um, I own Healthy Transformations, which is a private practice in New Hartford, where I do one-on-one -on -one consulting with people on a variety of health issues. I do have my master's in applied clinical nutrition, um, certified lifestyle educator with a program called First Line Therapy, which is going to be pretty much the base of the food component that we're going to be talking about today. Um, First Line Therapy was really designed for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So um, I do a lot of work with that. I'm a life coach as well. I do teach, obviously, here at MVCC, where I teach um, these classes as well as nutrition and dietetics. And I also teach in the medical program at Utica School of Commerce. Um, and I do have a 20-year-old son who's off in Denmark studying abroad this semester, having the time of his life. He's off traveling the country this week, so that's pretty cool. So I live through him, basically. So in terms of what to expect, I realize with this one, this is probably what Matt's going to have to do for me. He's going to just have to pull me off stage and say, time to go. <laughs> this is just another topic that there's a lot of information to cover. So we are going to be talking, obviously, about cardiovascular disease and all of the um, topics that really cover it, from cholesterol to blood pressure. Um, of course, there's obesity connections to it. We're going to talk about some labs. We're going to go in quite detail about foods and how they play a role and talking from a stress management standpoint as well as a little bit about exercise and cardiovascular disease. So we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. So I'm going to do my best to watch a clock and keep us on task. Um, this is a uh, map just giving us an idea between 2007 and 2008, the death rates associated with heart disease. You can see some of the common trends, like what happens down here, down in these southern states, right? You can see that really bright red. These are high incidences um, of death rates associated to cardiovascular disease. But if you look up here in New York State, we have a little pocket here where we get a little bit less incidence, but really if we were to look, I bet you we're probably one of the orange, um, which puts us at a, a pretty moderate risk level when it comes to the amount of people dying from heart disease. And this is age 35 and older. 35, I think we'd all agree, is pretty young to be having deaths due to heart disease, but it is happening. Here's some of the facts, and I think um, everybody should be a little bothered by it. Hello there. Um, first and foremost, it's about 600 deaths per year, which is basically one in four deaths that occur are occurring from heart disease. That's a pretty high number. It still remains to be the leading cause of death for men and women. Um, this is kind of one of my little pet peeves, and you'll hear my different viewpoints on this. We do more fundraising now for heart disease than I think we ever have. We have a lot of awareness programs out there, and yet it's always remained the number one killer. What are we doing wrong? Why does this remain there if we're you know, doing all these great things and striving towards better research? This is a big problem still. Uh, 935,000 heart attacks a year. That's one every 34 seconds. Every 34 seconds. So during the course of this, this class, there's going to be a lot of heart attacks had, right? Not in here. Not in here, though. That's right. Not in here. Um, it's costing about $109 billion each year in medical costs. This is direct and uh, indirect costs. So the direct costs of things like the drugs, but indirect costs including time off of work um, and, and factors like that. But $109 billion and we wonder why our medical system is in shambles. This is just one disease costing this much. For women, um, I focus in on this because uh, I don't know why we tend to forget that women play a big role um, or have a, a big contributing factor to the numbers that we're talking about. It is the number one killer for women. 
One in four women have some sort of cardiovascular disease, and one in two will die from it, of the one in four that have it. Those are pretty big numbers. And I put this up here because it's one in 25 that will die from breast cancer. And we create an awful lot of awareness around breast cancer, do we not? An awful lot. We have a whole month dedicated. You can buy pink everything now all year long. And I'm not dis discounting that, you know, more power to you to support that. That's one in 25 women who will die from breast cancer, but one in two will die from heart disease. This is big. Um, about 38% of women will die within one year of whatever their cardiac event is, compared to only 25% of men. So women, we have much higher risks. The scary part is that most of them never have a symptom. 64% have zero symptomology. Just walking along, boom, we'll call it a heart attack, and your odds are 50-50 that you might die from it. It's scary. I know this is like doom and gloom right now, right? I mean, bearer of bad news for sure. But it's, it's important to know. And of course, their rate is much higher after menopause. When we get that decline in estrogen, uh, cardiovascular disease risk factors increase tremendously. The neat thing about it that's not talked about very often, and this is a fact, and this is coming from your government agencies, such as the National Institute for Health and the CDC, that this is a lifestyle disease that is completely reversible and preventable. But yet we're getting nowhere with it. It remains number one. It's killing us by the, the hundreds of thousands. And yet it's reversible and has everything to do with lifestyle. I just like this little cartoon because I think this really sums up the medical world in general. We're so busy mopping the floor up from the water that we didn't take the time to turn the faucet off. <laughs> right? Is this what happens? I mean, we're just covering up symptoms, covering, 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 and we never look to see what the real issue was, which is the fact that the water's running. <laughs> This is traditional medicine, in my opinion, and how it kind of sums up our approach, not only to cardiovascular disease, but many of the chronic diseases out there. So when we talk about um, risk factors for cardiovascular disease, what we typically think of are these top five bullets, I call them. These top five risk factors. And this is where most doctors focus their attention. Your elevated cholesterol, especially if it's the LDL cholesterol. You have high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you smoke, and you're obese. These are the top five risk factors. But yet there are a ton, and you're gonna see, a ton of risk factors that truly will determine your likelihood of having a cardiac event. And they're not really based on these top five. Actually what it shows, um, Mark Houston, if you ever want to do some, some good reading, I actually brought his book if anybody wants to kind of peek through it. Um, it's what your doctor may not tell you about heart disease. He also has one about uh, what he may not tell you about high blood pressure. Um, but Mark Houston is a very brilliant cardiologist. Um, I have pulled some of his slides actually from a cardiovascular um, conference that I went to that he was a, a speaker in. Um, talking about basically you have a 50-50 shot. When you look at only these risk factors, which is really where traditional medicine is focused, when you're only looking at those, you have a 50-50 shot of them having something to do with your cardiovascular event. And I say event because it could be a heart attack, it could be a stroke, it could be anything that would land you in the hospital. So what do I mean by that? I mean you could go into the hospital and have all of these in check, all normal, and you still have a 50-50 shot of having a heart attack. Or you could go and have all of these out of whack and never end up in the hospital. It's a 50-50 shot. And yet our focus is all on this. It's not really good odds, is it? I mean, 50-50, throw the dice. See where you land. Are you in the hospital or aren't you? They're not really good markers if it's a 50-50 shot. Okay, you have high cholesterol, you might have a heart attack. You might not. But we get scared that you're going to, right? I see some people who come in, doctor said my cholesterol's elevated. 
Let me see the labs. 210. Okay, that's not really a big deal. What's the rest of the picture look like? Um, our levels of cholesterol, the, the lab markers have changed over the years too, right? Big time. Anybody remember when cholesterol, normal cholesterol used to be 250 or below? And now it's 200 or below? That's a big change. That's a big change. And for what? A 50-50 shot. Right. They want, right. So what, what, what happens with that? This is, of course, my little conspiracy theory thoughts, right? But we lower those numbers, and what do we do? Add drugs. You, you can sell more drugs, right? The pharmaceutical companies definitely can sell more drugs when you put those lab values down. So, but the reason I'm making the point is that you might have an elevated cholesterol of 250, but the odds are simply you got a 50-50 shot of ending up with a cardiovascular event as a result. So is it bad? I don't know, flip the coin, see which way it falls. Now I'm not telling you ignore this type of information, you know, and, and don't take any advice and don't take the stands. I'm not, well, I'm kind of saying that, but not really. Uh, um, but just know it's not the end all and be all. We've got to look past these top five. Yes, this is where a majority of research is talked about when we're talking about cardiovascular disease. But basically, the odds are that the odds don't matter. That's all there is to it. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is really, it's, it, it sums things up. We just don't know based on those five only. We do have some other risk factors when we're looking at them that these are all modifiable risk factors meaning we can change these. So we can decide, for instance, to stop smoking, right? Risk factor, one of those top five bullets. You can get rid of it. High blood pressure, you can certainly treat that. There's a lot you could do. You could get rid of it. Um, having a high LDL, we can get rid of that. If you're overweight, you can lose some weight. High triglycerides, change your diet, you can modify that. Diabetes can certainly be changed. Um, there are certain medications. Oral contraceptives are a big one. Big, big, big women. Women, women. If you have young women in your life, um, have a serious conversation with them about alternatives. Um, if you ever read the inserts on birth control pills, the side effects that you most commonly see are all associated to cardiovascular disease because these type of drugs, along with many drugs out there, deplete the body of some of the key nutrients that the body needs in order to support a healthy cardiovascular system, such as B12. B12 is needed for heart, uh, a healthy cardiovascular system. Oral contraceptives, drop your B12 level. Guess what great drug also drops your B12 level? Statins. Now, what do we take a statin for? Cholesterol. We want to lower our cholesterol, so we take a statin drug. Statin drugs now deplete your body of B12, which is needed for it to naturally be preventative against cardiovascular risk factors. Imagine that. There are a lot of drugs that do a depletion of the B vitamins. So it's being very aware, but we can modify those things. We can choose different alternatives for that. Of course, a sedentary lifestyle, we all have, that's the beauty of, of the human body, we all have the ability, for the most part, to move. And we don't have to do a lot of it, we just have to do it, right? <laughs> Our body was meant to be in motion. Um, stress, we're going to talk about this. Yes, modifiable. It takes a little practice, though, to really get this under control. And of course, alcohol intake, which is another risk factor that can certainly be modified. So all of these risk factors that we think of, including those top five, why the National Institute for Health and the CDC say that this disease is reversible is because all of this is by choice. In reality, it's all by choice. You decide to take the drug. You decide not to move. You decide to deal with stress by drinking too much. You decide to deal with stress by smoking. You decide that because you're not moving and eating too much and drinking too much and respond to stress that you're overweight, right? These are all our choices. 
ultimately, and we can change all of these things. So let's look at cardiovascular. Um, this was done 2011. This is cholesterol screening in the past five years, um, age 20 and older. We, do you realize that kids are being tested for, cardio, uh, for cholesterol now? That's a sad sign of the times, really sad sign of the times. But what I want to point out, of course, what do we want to focus in on? We want to focus in on our state. And look, we're in the highest bracket. We have 78 to 84 percentile. We are in the highest bracket, New York State is. We got a lot of people walking around with high cholesterol here. So what, what does this mean? Well, yes, two times the risk of having some sort of cardiovascular event. There's no doubt that cholesterol is one of the risk factors. Basically, one out of three have elevated LDL. LDL is known as your bad cholesterol. It's not really bad. We've just kind of termed it as bad. Um, these are some of your ideal numbers. This is also on one of your handouts. So you have them. Actually, on your handout, what I've done is put what I deem as, Bob, would you like these? what I deem as the um, ideals. Um, so it's towards the back of your packet. You got a lot of handouts, so I'm going to try to walk you through these. Um, maybe about the third to the last on this sheet here. Um, and I've put some of the ideal numbers. We're going to talk about all of these numbers. But these numbers that you see up on the screen right now, these are the numbers designed uh, or dedicated by places like the CDC, our government um, institutions, the basic lab values. So cholesterol should be under, total cholesterol should be under 200. Your HDL should be above 60. It, it, it is actually, sorry, it is 50, yes. Um, your LDL less than 100 and your triglycerides less than 150. These are kind of the standards. Um, I like to see the LDL lower, you know, 100 or under anyway. Um, but again, we got a 50-50 shot. So we're going to talk about actually digging in a little deeper to the LDLs and understanding a little bit more about what they mean. So cholesterol is one of those factors. Uh, hypertension is another factor, your high blood pressure. Um, we do a little better in New York State when it comes to high blood pressure. Um, we're not that high, as high of a mark, but we're somewhere around the 20, 30% uh, mark with this. And high blood pressure, this is affecting a lot of people as well. Right now we're about 68 million people, which is one in three Americans having high blood pressure. Um, and mo about, about half of them are not controlled. So we're walking around using all kinds of drugs and still not controlled with this. Um, another 30% of Americans are pre-hypertensive. So they haven't been put on any drugs yet, but they're walking around kind of borderline. You know, numbers are creeping up. Maybe stress is hitting them a little bit more frequently, trying to keep those numbers uh, from really being in the normal range. Um, I really, really like this statistic right here. Reducing sodium from 3,300 milligrams down to the RDA value, which is 2,300 milligrams. Look at what that alone would do to health care costs. That's per day. Yes, per day. It could reduce health care costs by $18 billion a year with one change. That is huge. That is huge. I like read that and reread that because I wanted to make sure I was looking at it properly before I put it up here, right? One small change. And what's the biggest source of sodium in our diets? Processed foods, junk food. Is this not totally modifiable? Completely. You know, I hear people say, well, I've got, I've got high blood pressure. I've got to be on a low salt diet. I can't have any salt. No, you can't have junk food. <laughs> you can put a little salt on your broccoli if you choose to. You'll be okay, I promise. Avoid that canned soup that's got like, you know, 1,500 milligrams in it or something crazy, right? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about reducing our sodium load. 
currently about $131 billion plus another $25 billion just in lost productivity to hypertension. And these are yearly figures. So if you take $131 billion and can reduce it by $18 billion alone, sure, that's still a big number, but $18 billion just by reducing your sodium down to the RDA value. Could you imagine what our health care would look like if everybody was healthy? Imagine. I, I just think it's kind of neat. Um, your blood pressure labs. So normal is 120 over 80. Some people are, some labs, some um, doctors are pushing now 110 over 70. 120 over 80 has been the standard for quite some time, and I think you're pretty safe there. Prehypertension is when you're ranging between the 120 and 139 over 80 to 89. And then you are considered to have high blood pressure when you're 140 over 90 or more. Okay, so those are the numbers. So ideally you're looking at that 120 over 180 mark as a, as a good acceptable healthy um, range. One of the things that we have to talk about when talking about cardiovascular disease is obesity. It's a must. There are connections between the two. Matter of fact, there's connections between obesity and basically every chronic disease out there. You can't escape it. Um, this is kind of, you know, a little jab, right? But this is kind of where we've gone. You know, we really did very quickly go from like slender being to extremely overweight population in a short period of time in the mix of things, in a very short period of time. A lot changed very quickly when we look at this. And when we, ha we have to look at the various trends that go along with it. The consumption of soda increased, obesity increased. The consumption of artificial sweeteners increased, obesity increased. The availability of processed foods increased, obesity increased. And these are almost mirroring each other when you're looking statistically at them. But yet we, on some level, tend to just not want to believe that there has anything to do with food we're eating, <laughs> right? But big changes in the obesity trends. Figures here from the CDC. Well, if you've been in my class before, you probably have. We're just going to flip through. This is going to go from 1985 up to 2010. Okay, and what you'll see is that down here, if you can see it, um, basically the white means no data. Um, the light blue is less than 10% obesity rates, and the darker blue is 10 to 14% obesity rate. Okay, so this was 1985. This isn't that long ago, right? And we're just going to flip through year by year and watch what happens to our country. Three years later four years, five years, 91, we add another category. We're now up to 15 to 19% obesity trends in these states that are darker. We keep going, and there's more. Now every state has obesity trends that we're tracking as of 94. We add to it. Oh, look, we had to add another category in 1997. Twelve years later, we now have an over 20% of the population's obese. Let's keep going. Oh, let's add another one, 2001. Now it's over 25% obese. Oh, gosh, that wasn't good enough. Four years later, we had to add another one. Now it's over 30. Oop, we went too far. And that's where we are as of 2010. That the lowest number we have is the 15 to 20, uh, sorry, excuse me, the 20% range. So 20% or higher obesity rates in every state in our country from 1985 to 2010. That's pretty substantial. And we wonder where we're not getting anywhere in terms of cardiovascular disease and, and these other chronic illnesses we're dealing with. Obesity continues to rise. Basically, two-thirds of all adult Americans are overweight or obese. Children, we're looking at one-third. One-third of our children are obese or overweight. 
this is scary. If anybody works in a school system or has young children and just watch, just pay attention as you walk around. Pay attention to kids, you know, when you're in the grocery store or anything else like that. They are much larger today than ever we could have ever grew them before. <laughs> much, much larger. Um, I, as a few of you know, my son goes to um, school at University of Virginia. And his first semester there, we, now we knew that University of Virginia had a reputation for being a very fit campus. They've been, you know, one of the top five for many years. They're, they're known for people just being very active and running and eating healthy and organic and things of that nature. Well, just one semester there, he got very used to this environment. And he came home on his Christmas break. And as, you know, just normal stuff, just being out and about, and he just, you know, he looks at me one day, and he's just shaking his head, and he goes, I can't believe how big people are here in comparison, because now he's used to very rarely seeing somebody overweight, just different cultures, right? He's now over in Denmark, and same thing. <clears throat> Obesity is like non-existent there. Everybody, he said everybody kind of has his build. He's, you know, slender, he's a fit, he's not buff, but, you know, he's, he's got a nice little shape to him. And that's how everybody is over there, just healthy. And here in the United States, we're just getting bigger and bigger by the minute. And we wonder why things are going wrong. Yes? Uh -huh. One of the interesting things, too, when you're looking at facts, and it's, it's a nice thing that you bring up, the um, trends when you look from from immigrants or second generation people, kids that are here, and in particular with the Asian population. Because the Asian population has been very, very much known for being a tiny, petite population. And what happens, so we talk about it being in our genes, right? Like, oh, well, it's in my genes because mom's overweight and dad had a heart attack, and so it's just all in my genes. I don't stand a chance, right? Well, their genes from Asia, their parents coming over, are you're thin, you're healthy, no problems, no incidence of cancer or heart disease or anything like that. They come here and in one generation, one, they completely change the makeup of their body. That's not genetics. Genetics haven't changed. We have not really changed since we looked like cavemen from a genetic standpoint. So it is the environment that we are exposed to, right? And what's popping up across the world everywhere McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Burger Kings, all of these places. My grandmother went to, um, this was quite some time ago too, she went traveling all over the place in Egypt. She couldn't wait to see the pyramids and the Sphinx and all that, and she was so highly disappointed that just down the street was a McDonald's. She was like, it ruins the whole ambiance, right? I mean, how do you have a McDonald's next to the Sphinx? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Right? But we've, we've really pushed that on other cultures. And so now people are eating more Americanized. And one of the fastest growing, uh, fastest um, increases in diabe diabetes and obesity is actually occurring in China as we speak because we've Americanized them over there. And they've taken thousands of years of a good, healthy, plant based, nutrient dense food. And we've Americanized them. We've introduced soda and McDonald's and processed food and fast food, and they are the fastest area, uh, fastest population for growth with diabetes. Um, one of the numbers to look at from a cardiovascular standpoint and from an obesity standpoint is called your waist to hip ratio. This is important because it's looking at the distribution of fat. So this is a number that you should know. Um, this is kind of looking at that apple versus pear shape when you hear that terminology. But waist-hip ratios are numbers that are being very readily, or very commonly used now in research because it's such an easy number to get from everybody. Let's look at it. And how does it compare? So in women, you want your waist to be less than 35 inches, and you want the waist-to-hip ratio to be less than 0.8. So when you take your waist, divide by your hip, it should be 0.8 or less. Less cardiovascular risk factors, just because of the way that the weight is distributed. Now, keeping in mind, it does not mean, we'll just take this woman up here, skinny, her waist-to-hip ratio could still be over 0.8. 
Okay, so you don't have to be obese to have a large waist to hip ratio. And that is why skinny people can also have cardiovascular events. It happens, right? You don't need to be obese for this to happen. Is it a factor? Yes. Does it contribute? Absolutely. But it is not the end all and be all. So it's looking at how that fat is distributed in the body. For men, you want your waist to be less than 40 inches and that waist to hip ratio to be less than 0.1. So when you're looking at the measurement, you know, some people kind of go, well, what's really the waist? It's the narrowest part of the, of the body. Not the waist like, you know, um, you know, the kids that are wearing pants down to here. That's not the waist. That's really the hip. But the hip is really the widest section, not necessarily the, you know, the top of the hip bone, but your widest section. So think your narrowest and your widest section um, when making those measurements, okay? So anybody, you can do that on yourself. One little key, make sure your feet are together. <laughs> You'll get a much different number if your feet are apart, right? <laughs> so keep your feet together when you do that measurement. So I like, this was our solution as a, as a culture, as a government. We took, everybody familiar with the BMI, body mass index? You take your standard height and weight chart, so you find your height, you find your weight, and you come up with a number, right? So normal BMI is between 18.5 and 24.9. That's a healthy range. We always had the overweight range of uh, 25 to 29.9. And then we have an obese category of 30 to 40. And when that wasn't good enough, we added on morbidly obese, which is a 40 to 50 BMI. And when we thought that wasn't good enough, we added a super morbid obesity range, which is a BMI of over 50. This is our solution. Instead of fixing the problem, instead of stopping somebody from getting here, we just added on another category, somehow making it okay. Instead of saying, wait a minute, this could be a problem. If you're morbidly obese, <laughs> is that not a problem? That's saying you're going to die because you're too fat. How about we fix it and reverse here instead of just going, oh, let's add another one. And you could be super morbidly obese. This is how we've handled it. It's a really poor management, right? We're busy mopping the floor instead of turning off the water. That's what we're doing. And look at this, just as a comparison. Here's Asian BMI ranges, different for this population. So normal BMI, 18.5 to 22.9 instead of 24.9. You're overweight if you go from 23 to 27.4 rather than 29.9. Obese, 27.5 to 32.4. But look, they're super morbidly obese at something at a BMI over 37.5 rather than our 50. Right? So genetics plays a role. Culturally, there are different ranges. So an Asian population has more of an increased obesity and the risk factors that go along with it as soon as their BMI hits, you know, well, really, as soon as their BMI is hitting down here. But, you know, we're comparing that to a Caucasian at over 50. It's really not the solution to anything. We've just categorized. Because we like to do that. We like to put people in, you know, like, oh, you have this. Oh, I'll give you this diagnosis, so now you fit in this little frame of whatever. I guess it makes people happy to have it. Has everybody heard the term metabolic syndrome? Or syndrome X? Um, metabolic syndrome is basically, and the reason we're talking about this, so you're probably all like, yeah, when do we get into the heart disease part? <laughs> we're leading up to it with all of this. All of this really is leading into it. So metabolic syndrome is defined having three of the five of these. Elevated blood pressure, that's a cardiovascular risk, right? Elevated triglycerides, cardiovascular risk. Low HDL or good cholesterol. So the top three right here all have to do with cardiovascular, right? You could have an elevated glucose level, talking about blood sugar, potential diabetes, and that increased waist to hip ratio. If you have three of five of these, you have what's called metabolic syndrome. Maybe your doctor just hasn't told you. Why is this important? Because it's leading down the road to 
diabetes, and cardiovascular concerns. So you should know this. Right now, one in three people in the U.S. have it. We are continually leading down that road. We are getting closer and closer and contributing more and more to the potential of having a cardiovascular risk uh, event taking place. So we have to talk about this in the whole mix. There's a whole term called diabesity. Sometimes I have to catch myself in terms of saying diabetes and obesity because I now, in the functional medicine world, um, Mark Hyman, if anybody has followed or seen any of his work, he, he really kind of coined this term diabesity because of the connections between diabetes and obesity. And what's really happening, you can see some of the things. Well, this is where cardiovascular disease is kind of stemming from. You don't really get to a cardiovascular event without having potentially some other issues. Things like, you know, um, dyslipidemia, where your, your lipids start to, to get off a little bit. Um, maybe some obesity or type 2 diabetes has developed. Um, for women, look at this is a big one. A lot of women dealing with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. A lot of, a lot of young girls dealing with it. And this stems from right here, which is insulin resistance, which is basically you're just using your food really bad. You're eating too much processed stuff. The insulin is being pumped out too much. You're not utilizing your glucose properly. And it's leading to all of these other things. And cardiovascular disease is one of them. It starts somewhere, right? You don't just wake up one day and like, oh, my cholesterol's high today, and yesterday it was normal. It doesn't happen like that. It's a slow progression, right? Maybe you went one time and it was 200, and the next time you went it was 205, and next time you went, it's 210. It's a slow progression. Glucose, oh, you're still within normal ranges, even though you're just one point below, so we won't worry about it yet. You know, we don't worry about it until it's abnormal. So these are all things leading up. So we have to think about widening our lens, looking at the big picture is what it comes down to. Because right now, we're focused here. We look at cholesterol, we look at blood pressure, and we miss the big picture. Bottom line, just like every other disease, we talked last week about thyroid. Looking at TSH is looking here. Actually, looking at TSH is like looking there only. <laughs> right? We've got to look in and see the whole picture and what's going on. So some of the top pathways, basically, that, that are considered is that there's a lot to look at when it comes to cardiovascular disease. And some of these we've talked a little bit about, and we're going to talk some more about, things like the blood pressure and blood sugar and um, the obesity. But we're going to start with inflammation, because that is the core to what the problem is with cardiovascular disease. Actually, that is the core to every chronic disease out there, is inflammation. Time did this piece quite some time ago that it's the secret killer. Because essentially you can think of inflammation as like a, just a, it's a fire going on in your body. You are on fire. That's all there is to it. Your body is on fire for whatever reason, and it can be many, many reasons. We tend to think of inflammation as just you fell down, you sprained your ankle, the ankle got inflamed, and, you know, then it goes down. You know, those classic signs of inflammation. Pain, heat, swelling, redness. Right? With this, we're talking about that internal inflammation. You cannot have high cholesterol and not have inflammation going on. You can't have high blood pressure and not have inflammation going on. Inflammation is truly the key when it comes to managing every chronic disease out there. I will tell you, the reason I named the class um, that good health is a heartbeat away, when you are properly taking care of your body in terms of cardiovascular health, by default, you affect everything else for the positive, by default. Because when we're approaching it from the cardiovascular standpoint, we're gonna approach it from calming inflammation down. So sure, we're going to calm inflammation down. What does that mean? Well, potentially it means maybe there's inflammation going on in your gut and you have some GI disturbance going on. We're going to calm that down. Maybe the inflammation is causing some arthritis pain. We can calm that down. 
Maybe you get headaches because you're inflamed all the time. We can calm that down because the approach is the same no matter what. If inflammation is present, the bottom line, there's a fire. We need to get water on it, not gasoline. That's all there is to it. So by actually going in and focusing in on the inflammation, we by default affect many other systems in our body. It's really cool because the body doesn't work all in these separate you know, systems like we, we think it, do, it does. Um, oxidation or oxidative stress. Has anybody heard that term? Anybody got an idea what oxidation is? Rust. Rust. That's what it is. <laughs> Rust. That's what oxidation is. Guess what? This goes on in your body. Isn't that kind of gross? This goes on in your body. Oxidative stress. What does that mean, or what's causing oxidative stress? Well, we'll start with uh, talking about some of the de diseases that I call the rusting diseases that are affected by oxidative stress. Alzheimer's, oxidative stress. Your coronary heart disease, arthritis, cancer, diabetes, Parkinson's, stroke. There's a long list of diseases associated with oxidative stress. Essentially, this concept of free radical damage. Have you heard some of these terms? And just kind of like, what the heck are you talking about? What does that mean? Well, I'll sum it up really brief and easy for you. First and foremost, our sources of oxidative stress start with, start with the standard American diet. You know that acronym? Standard American diet is sad. How appropriate is that? I mean, really. It's so appropriate, because it is. This is the standard American diet. And so what does that mean? It is loaded with a bunch of junk that contributes to the internal rusting of your body. Why? Because there's no nutritional value here. You have calories but no nutritional value here. Another lifestyle factor that greatly contributes to oxidative stress, as you could imagine, is smoking. Creates all kinds of damage. And I pulled this up. Does anybody see, not too long ago, there was this video that was circulating around of some little boy who smoked like five packs a day. And these kind of pictures are up all the time, that's why I have to throw it up there. You kind of look at him, I, I don't know how old he is, I'm going to guess like six. Look how overweight he is and he's smoking. Fantastic, you don't stand a chance there, kid. <laughs> and then the obesity problem contributes to oxidative stress. You know, we're kind of sitting back and going, what's the problem? We just added another BMI marker. Who's, who's obese? We don't have a problem here. We got somewhere to put you. So what does it mean? This is where it really puts it in perspective. Oxidative stress needs to get offset by antioxidants. Everybody's heard that term, right? Antioxidants are basically like, here's a little bit of broccoli, right? Because he's loaded in things like vitamin C and vitamin E and all of these great nutrients that are able to kick the bad guys out. Get the rust out of here. Get that damage out of here. Stop damaging our cells. But the way to do that is through dietary changes. Antioxidants, we hear about them. Some of your common ones, vitamin C, vitamin E. Glutathione is your, your mother antioxidant, if you will. Um, N-acetylcysteine, this is commonly used as an antioxidant. But you know, you just start thinking about these things that help to prevent our internal rusting. How can you not get better health? Not just cardiovascular-wise, but all over. By default, you're just going to get better health because your cells are happy. They're not rusting. How great. I mean, just think about it. Like, next time, if you're tempted to go to, like, McDonald's or something, just think about that old rusty car. That's your insides. That's what that's doing. It's just damaging those cells. Hypertension, we talked a little bit about, but some of the things that can increase hypertension. Caffeine. We're a pretty caffeine-dependent society, more so than we've ever been. People just function on this. 
or working longer hours. We're you know, running on empty most of the time, not getting enough sleep, so we're using caffeine to keep us awake. We've got a project, so let's have some more because I've got to keep going until 11 o'clock tonight, things of that nature. It can increase because we don't have enough magnesium. Magnesium is found in green leafy vegetables. Imagine that. Somebody's low in magnesium in our culture. I can't imagine why. <laughs> With all the green leafy vegetables everybody's eating? Yeah, right. You know, people just aren't eating these foods, so now we have low magnesium content uh, uh, um, uh, levels in our body. So that could be a reason for hypertension. Low CoQ10 levels, especially if somebody's on a statin. They get on a statin, and now what becomes a problem? Now their blood pressure increases. So now we've got to get on a diuretic for the blood pressure. Right? If we smoke, that can increase it. Stress is definitely going to increase hy uh, hypertension. Right? If you've ever had a moment, just for giggles sometime, get really mad at your significant other and take your blood pressure and see where it's at. <laughs> It'll be high. It'll be high. Stress can really contribute there. Um, having low antioxidants down here, one of the bottom ones here, talking about D and C and E, those can contribute. But you know what the real big problem actually is? Uh, it, well, that's a contributor. How about white coat syndrome? How many people only have hypertension when they go to the doctor? And they want to put you on drugs, right? Yeah. A lot of people, when they walk into the doctor by default, it's called white coat syndrome. You get very nervous. You get anxious about what they may have to say, what they're going to do. And now what happens automatically is the body's natural response is to increase your blood pressure in response to that. So we do have an, a, a portion of people who are walking around potentially taking drugs to lower their hypertension that's only high when they're in the doctor's office. I'm not saying everybody but it's a contributing factor. So you really should know what your blood pressure is outside of the doctor's office. You know, if even going to Walgreens and hooking yourself up to that machine is going to give you a little anxiety, get one of the little machines and take it at home. When you can be relaxed and, and just in your own environment and really see where that is. And take it at various times throughout the day. Let's just say you had to park way over in, you know, I don't know, Utica College to get here, <laughs> right? You had to park kind of far away. And then you walk across the parking lot, and then you have to walk up the stairs, and then you came in on the wrong side, so you had to walk all the way down the hallway. And as soon as you got here, I said, let me take your blood pressure. It's going to be high. It's going to be elevated. It should. You just walked from one area to another, had to come upstairs, went around. Maybe you're late trying to find the place. Naturally, it should be high. That's a the natural response. So you want to have, take your blood pressure at various times, too. You could have been rushing to get to the doctor's appointment, and that alone could have increased your blood pressure. So it's, you know, it's, it could be a false reading. And maybe every time you go to the doctor's, you're running late. Or maybe you're really irritated because you just sat there for an hour and a half waiting, so your blood's starting to boil. And then they go in there and say, let me take your blood pressure. And you're like, are you kidding? I've just been sitting for an hour and a half waiting for an appointment. Right? That could make it go high. So paying attention to that. But we have a lot of other factors too. So we've got to think, do I have too much caffeine? Am I getting enough magnesium? What is my stress level? Where are these other factors as well? The blood sugar response. Again, we talked a little bit about this and talking about that apple shape, that metabolic syndrome. But things that can increase your blood sugar response. The biggest thing is is too high of a diet in refined carbohydrates, a.k.a. processed foods. Chips, cookies, breads, you know, all the junk food that's out there. Basically everything you find in the middle aisles of a grocery store, right? Or the average restaurant. Refined carbs. Um, high fructose corn syrup. Anybody see those ads in the newspaper that uh, high fructose corn syrup? It's good for you. Have you seen that they took out those ads? This has been a little bit. Full page ads. Oh, it's healthy. It comes from corn. High fructose corn syrup is not good for you. And the way that they've tried to now mask it is that you might see this as high maltose corn syrup. It's the same processed junk. 
don't be fooled. So you might now start to see high maltose corn syrup instead of high fructose corn syrup. This really starts to mess with the blood sugar, big time, big increases. Um, blood sugar can also be affected by low vitamin D levels. For those that were in the class last week with thyroid, we talked about vitamin D. Basically, we don't stand a chance in New York State. We just don't get enough sun here. We're too far north, even when the weather is nice. Um, and when it is nice and you do get some exposure, now we cover up with sunscreen because you should, so you don't get sun cancer or skin cancer, I mean. So low vitamin D levels contribute to a lot of things. Inflammation one is one of them. Oxidative stress is one of them. And blood sugar abnormalities is one of them. And of course, we learned from last week, it also contributes to poor thyroid function. <laughs> Right? So low vitamin D levels really affect a lot of things. Uh, low chromium or electrolyte levels will affect this. Certain medications, and of course we have the obesity and non-movement again, all contribute. And again, why are we doing this? Because all of this plays a role in your heart health. Bottom line, it all plays a role. If your blood sugar is not maintained or in control, it's affecting your heart health. If they're too much, if too much weight, if you're overweight, obese, it's affecting your heart health. If you smoke, it's affecting your heart health. All of these factors play a role. Now, some of this stuff is where I, I pulled this from Mark, uh, excuse me, um, Mark Houston. This is a partial list of the pathophysiology behind cardio, uh, um, coronary heart disease. Partial list. So I just want to talk about some of these. We talked about, really? We talked about inflammation, right? We talked about hyperinsulinemia. This is basically, we're talking about blood, blood sugar and the insulin response. We talked about oxidative stress a little bit. But we get into mitochondrial dysfunction. Oh, what does that mean? That sounds kind of interesting. Anybody fatigued? Low energy? Know anybody with low energy? Mitochondria are the little powerhouses, the little you know, energy makers inside of our cells. And mitochondria uh, are important for producing something called ATP, which is essentially energy. It's how all of our cells get energy. So mitochondrial dysfunction can take place, which basically, if you think about this at a cellular level, at the end of the day, we are one big bundle of cells. That's what we are, about 100 trillion or so of them. That's all we are. If the little powerhouses that make energy inside of our cells aren't working right, hmm, let's just pretend we're a heart cell and we're not making enough energy. Could that lead to some dysfunction in the heart or potential disease of the heart? Yeah, the cells don't have enough energy to function. One of the contributors to mitochondrial dysfunction is inflammation, hyperinsulinemia, and oxidative stress that can lead to the mitochondria not working right. Um, if we talk about autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease can work in this fashion. Autoimmune disease, basically your body's attacking itself. If your body's attacking itself for any reason, does that put added stress on your heart? in cardiovascular system? Yep. So that could be an underlying cause. Um, heavy metal toxicity, there's been a lot of research behind um, toxicity in general, but especially when we start talking about heavy metals like the lead and mercury, arsenic, things like that that are finding, we're finding in our food sources. And the burden it puts on the cardiovascular disease. Things that it binds to in the blood that can cause it to get clogged up or to get sticky. So maybe you have a ex heavy exposure. And, and you, you, know, my, you might think, well, no, I don't. I don't live in anything like that. How much mercury is in your mouth? Meaning, how many fillings do you have that are mercury fillings? We put it right in there. Hi. Hi, body. Let's expose you to a heavy metal that's very toxic, by the way. And let's get a little bit released all the time because we're always chewing and having, uh, you know, things going on in the mouth. That's what happens. Um, we talked last week, 
hypothyroidism. Connection with cardiovascular disease. If anybody remembers, one of the, the factors with hypothyroidism could be a connection with LDL being abnormal. They go hand in hand. Um, I always like this one. I think I, I, some people get shocked. Do you know your dentist knows more about your cardiovascular health than your regular doctor does most of the time by looking in your mouth? Anybody hear that before? You should go for the, to the dentist regularly, not just so you can have nice pearly white teeth, but because there's a lot of signs right in our mouth, especially when it comes to gum disease. So if your, if your um, gums are bleeding when you floss or you brush, you're inflamed. That could be one of the first signs of inflammation. Hmm, who knew? TMJ issues. This little joint here, you know, where you yawn and all of a sudden maybe your mouth stays open. You know, you're like, oh man. <laughs> or you get some clicking noise here. That's one of the first signs of inflammation. And there are connections between TMJ and cardiovascular disease. Who knew? Who would think? Right? So forget the cholesterol. Your jaw's been locking for five years. And that was really the sign that cardiovascular disease was a problem possible. Leaky gut. Anybody hear that term? I love that term. It just sounds gross, doesn't it? But it's actually, uh, this is a big problem. Essentially what's happened is the inflammation in the gut has led to the destruction of the lining of your intestines and it literally becomes leaky. You start releasing foods and nutrients and things like this out into your immune system that aren't meant to be there. This is where gluten becomes an issue. We were talking a little earlier about this. This is why gluten is a big issue. It's usually due to leaky gut. And then we create these antibodies against gluten and our immune system goes on attack. And before you know it, we're attacking the thyroid and we have an autoimmune process and now we can't lose weight and we're a hormonal mess and we're having hot flashes and blah, blah, blah. All started right here with inflammation. So a connection between poor gut health and cardiovascular disease. Now when you go to your digestive disease doctor, is he asking you and really digging in and trying to find out what's going on with you from a cardiovascular standpoint? Nope. Is your cardiologist asking you, hey, how are your bowel movements? Nope. Right? We're treating these as separate things and they're not. Um, iron excess. Iron excess is a common feature with cardiovascular disease as well. So this is a partial list, partial list, and some of the different things that, that we've talked about. Um, I just want to flip through here. I'm not going to go through all of these, but again, I pulled these from Mark Houston's presentation, and we did go through all of these. So remember I said you got a 50-50 shot with your top five bullets? Because there are so many other risk factors that we're not paying attention to. So this starts to go through his list. Anybody know a type A personality? I'm not aggressive, but I'm totally a type A personality. Would we agree? <laughs> right? Um, people who don't sleep, stress, anxiety. I'm just going to keep flipping through here just to see, because I stopped pulling them up. When I got to his last one, 150 different risk factors. And we focus on five. How can that be a predictor at all? It's almost impossible. That's why it's a 50-50 shot. We're focusing on some big ones, yes, but there's a lot of other risk factors, and that's why you can get the person who's like, you know, Johnny used to go out running every day, and he always ate good, and he just dropped out of a heart attack. His cholesterol was fine. He wasn't overweight. I don't understand. Well, because we missed 145 other factors. <laughs> We didn't pay attention to all this other stuff. We didn't pay attention to his stress level. We didn't ask him what his blood sugar was like. We didn't look at all the genetic side of things or whatever it may be. And we totally just breezed over this. So it's knowing really the big picture. And this is probably basically what you feel like now. Like, okay, Kim, so what? What am I supposed to do? Now I've got to watch all 150 risk factors? Are you kidding me? How am I supposed to do this? We're going to make it very simple. 
because the bottom line, no matter how you slice it or dice it, is it comes down to the, one of the first slides, which was, this is a preventable and reversible lifestyle disease. So what do we do? We get into the basics, okay? Um, I did put this terminology up here just to get familiar. Your LDL, you know, that bad cholesterol. Your HDL is the good. Total cholesterol, triglycerides. These are things that you're familiar with. But on your sheets of the, the numbers that you should know, you're going to see some other numbers like um, LPA or lipoprotein A. And I want to just talk about this a little bit. As well as the LDI, LDL size pattern. These are two things that I want to focus in on. Okay, um, basically when we're looking at cholesterol, you got your HDL and LDL we talked about, right? You take your LDL and now you can go down into these patterns. Pattern A, pattern AB, or pattern B. This can be done through testing. It's called a VAP test, V-A-P. A VAP test will actually look at your LDL particle sizes. Okay, pattern A is less, less risky. So let's just hypothetically say your LDL cholesterol is 150. But it's 150 with pattern A particle sizes. Basically it means that these LDL cholesterols are kind of big and fluffy. Okay, if it's high because you have the big and fluffy LDLs, it's protective. So now lowering the LDL might not be the right thing to do because you've got these big fluffy particles that are actually protective to the cardiovascular health. If you have high LDL but your pattern B, well then we'd probably really want to make sure that we reduce it because these are your little tiny ones and this is what's going to start to clog your arteries. So LDL isn't enough. HDL isn't really enough either, but this is where we focus some of the attention. Within HDL, there's several different proteins as well. Um, and one of the proteins, actually this does, I, I take this back, this one protein falls under the LDL. Um, they actually call it the death gene. Um, there are people who, um, I, I know of a family who basically no man has survived over 50 years old without dying from a cardiovascular event, regardless of what they've done. When you look at it genetically, I would be willing to say that they have what's called an apolipoprotein E pattern, meaning they don't stand a chance. It's genetics. It's going to happen, no matter what they do. You can prolong it with certain lifestyle things, but they literally call it the death gene. It's going to take somebody long, you know, in a, sh a shorter time period than somebody should go. But knowing this, knowing what your pattern is, you should ask for it next time you have your cholesterol done. You should ask for your pattern. I, I want to know if I'm LDL pattern A or B. And it's called a VAP test, V-A-P. Another test that you should know uh, it's not even a test, it's a ratio, because everybody gets these numbers. You get your triglycerides and you get your HDL. Looking at these two numbers and dividing them out is a good sign for how you're doing with insulin and if you're becoming insulin resistant. Why is this important? We talked about blood sugar and all of the things that it's leading to in cardiovascular health. Now I will say, most of the time, people don't get their insulin levels checked, and you should always get that checked. Glucose is not enough. But this is a good sign. Basically, this ratio should be three or under. If it is over three, chances are you are resisting insulin. So you're leading down that road. You're closer to diabetes. You're closer to those cardiovascular risk factors. Simple, easy. Listen, everybody, you've got your numbers at home. Divide it out. See what it is. You don't need to get an extra test for this one. Just see where you're at. I like this. Has anybody seen this before? Short history of medicine. Let's go through this. 2000 BC. Here, eat this root. In 1000 BC, that root is heathen. Say a prayer. 
1850 A.D., that prayer is superstition, drink this potion. By 1940 A.D., that potion is snake oil, swallow this pill. 1985, that pill is ineffective, take this antibiotic. And in 2000, that antibiotic, antibiotic is artificial, here, eat the root. <laughs> we are getting back to, a lot of people are really looking to get back to where we began. Right? We're getting back to really food as medicine. Um, the old, um, you know, everybody's familiar with the Hippocratic Oath and Hippocrates and his saying, let thy food be thy medicine. Right? I was just going over with my other class the original Hippocratic Oath. Um, you know, and part of the original Hippocratic Oath included things like, I will not give my patients a dangerous drug that they ask for. Hmm. Does that happen anymore? <laughs> First, is there really a safe drug out there? No, dangerous drugs all over the place. And how many people are going in and saying, hey, doc, I saw on TV this drug, and I think I need it. And they go, OK, I think you're right. <laughs> right? So you know, food is medicine, and we are getting back into that concept. And this is really the meat of this. It is simple when we just take it from the lifestyle. Now leading up to this, this is a little bit of that kind of stuff that should get you a little mad because we don't get the full picture when we're at the doctors. In reality, we don't need it as much if we just focus in on the food. Um, I like the term why power. It came from a book called uh, The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. It's a great read if you're ever looking, if you like reading. Um, it's not really a health book per se, but it's more of a uh, life book um, in applying things to your life that have the, the effect like compound interest. You know, a little bit goes a long way. You do a little bit and over time it builds up, right? That's how people build retirement accounts, right? Is with compound interest. So when it comes to health, a little bit goes a long way. And you can keep building on it and eventually you get the big results. So discovering your why power, um, when he, he utilized this, that to me was a term that just stuck because I have so many people come into me and say, I don't have willpower to do this. I don't have willpower to fight past this. How do you have the willpower to not go through the buffet line? How do you have the willpower to not have dessert when everybody else is? It's not about willpower. It's about your why power. Why are you doing this? Why are you choosing to eat healthy? Because ultimately it is your choice. And why are we doing it? So we're going to talk about the foods. And ultimately, I can't answer this question for you. You need to answer it for yourself. Why are you doing it? Why is it important that you do this? Currently, this is what we're doing in the course of a year. You ready for this? Um, 29 pounds of french fries, 23 pounds of pizza, 24 pounds of ice cream, 53 gallons of soda. It's about a gallon a week, a little bit more. Artificial sweeteners, 24 pounds. Sodium, you see that? 2,736 pounds of sodium, which is basically almost 50% higher than we need. Caffeine, it doesn't sound like much, but 0.2 pounds. It's a lot when we're taking in milligrams, really. And basically, the average person is 2,700 calories a day. Way too high. Way too high. Could you imagine, just like put like 23 pounds of pizza in front of, like that, that's just obnoxious. It's gross, right? I mean, it really is. But this is how we're eating. The typical American is eating during the course of the year. And then we're going to talk about what we should be eating. If you have not seen this documentary, I highly recommend it. It's called Food Matters. Um, you know, you can get it on something like a Netflix. Um, it's definitely on Netflix. Um, but, you know, I'm sure you, could, you can even watch it just online. But Food Matters is a fantastic documentary that really talks about the, the power of food. And the trailer goes, you know, you are what you eat. We know that saying, right? So what are you reflecting? Are you a hamburger or are you a salad? <laughs> right?
right? What, what's really being defined there? But the power of food, food is medicine. For the longest time, thousands and thousands of years, food is medicine. The problem is now we are using it as the poisonous medicine rather than the good medicine. So food, when it comes down to it, it really is providing all the essential nutrients that we need. We know this. But it's helping us adapt to the environment. So it's helping our genes kind of understand what's going on around us. It is protecting against damage, meaning it's protecting you from that rusting, that oxidative stress. Those nutrients are stopping from that. It's helping you repair quicker. But the big thing is that it provides our genetic information. Our genes, our DNA is like, it's like a blueprint, you know, and it needs an architect to read that paperwork, right? Having just the blueprint by itself is not going to get the building built, right? We need somebody to help build it. And that's what food can do. It can help upbuild and create this very strong powerhouse of a body, or it can be like, oh, we're crumbling. We got scaffolding all around just in case. Right? So it, there's really a tremendous amount of power behind food. Um, as I talked about, first line therapy is really a program that was designed for cardiovascular health and diabetes health. Hey, that's like an oxymoron, diabetes health. That's not really what it is, to reverse diabetes. <laughs> okay, It's a therapeutic lifestyle program. Now, therapeutic lifestyle program, or TLC, is very commonly used and recommended in research. In fact, it is recommended by places like the National Institute for Health as the first line of defense with cardiovascular disease and diabetes. The first line of defense is not take a statin and take metformin. It is a lifestyle change program. You go to other countries, um, England's one of them, it used to be anyway, um, but you go into somewhere like Australia, Australia it is mandatory that somebody embarks on a 12-week lifestyle program before a drug would be prescribed for high cholesterol or diabetes. Mandatory. Part of that comes down to government health system, right? The government's not going to pay for people to be sick. They want them healthy because they know how much it costs for somebody to be sick. So they want people healthy. And how do we do that? Through food. So everybody should give 12-week lifestyle a chance. And that's essentially the basis of first-line therapy. Um, so we're going to talk about the food perspective. I like this one, the pharmacy. <laughs> that's the kind of pharmacy we need to go to. <laughs> Take one a day with a tomato and cucumber. <laughs> He's hand, handing the lettuce over. That's the pharmacy we need. We're going to talk about foods. We're going to talk about this handout here that you have. This is the nuts and bolts, and this is the keeping it simple. Okay, all the complex stuff that was back there, we're going to simplify this down. So first and foremost, on the front page there, you're seeing balanced eating. So we have all of these great misconceptions now about diets and what's good and what's bad, and should we be high fat, high carb, low carb, high protein, no protein, how do you eat? It's called balanced. That's how we're supposed to eat. The body needs all three of these things to function properly. However, carbohydrates are our main source of fuel. This is how our energies really function. And when I'm talking about carbohydrates, I'm talking about things like you see here. Your vegetables, your fruits, your beans, to a little extent some dairy product, your grains. These are carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates, natural forms, body knows what to do with it. And we're going to go into each of these individually. Protein, we have a little bit of a crossover here with protein. You can see that it kind of crosses over here with dairy. But we're talking about animal and plant-based protein. And that being things like um, tofu, um, nuts and seeds. These are plant-based proteins. And then we have a little bit of a crossover here as well where things like your nuts and seeds also serve as a fat, which of course your oils, um, avocado, olives, these also serve as fats. The general rule of thumb when it comes to balanced eating is 
50% carbohydrates, 25% protein, 25% fat. That's what true balanced eating is. This is also known as a Mediterranean style food plan, if you've heard that terminology. Okay. Now when it comes to cardiovascular disease, there's a few different plans out there. Mediterranean style food plan is one of them. You might have heard of the DASH diet. Anybody hear of that one? The DASH diet. Basically it's a low sodium diet. One of the, it's still very much focused pretty much on the same principles here. Um, making sure that people are paying more attention to their sodium content though. But when you're eating real food, you don't really have to pay attention to it because you're just going to fall in the natural ranges. Um, and you might hear some talk about a paleolithic diet. And a paleolithic diet is going to do less on the grain side of things. Really, for the most part, you're going to eliminate grains. You may eliminate some fruits to lower your, lower your sugar levels. Um, so there's a few variations out there, and it really does depend a little bit on what's going on with you. This, for all intents and purposes, is true, healthy eating at its best. And there is not a disease out there that would not benefit from somebody eating in this fashion. A couple of the tips that are on the front of that sheet talk about your eating patterns in terms of timing. So essentially what you should do is you wake up, you have breakfast within 30 to 60 minutes of rising. And then you eat every three hours after that. And you stop three hours before you go to bed. Okay, so if there's one change that you can make today, if you don't do that, start it tomorrow. So when I say eating something every three hours, it might be a handful of nuts. You ate something, move on, eat three hours later. Okay, it doesn't have to be these big main meals, it can be the little snacking or that grazing mentality. If you don't do that now, try it tomorrow and try it for the next couple weeks. Okay, you can balance a lot of things out just by doing this, but we're talking about eating real food, of course. Um, one of the other tips that's on there is talking about eating the rainbow. So when we start talking about our vegetables and our fruits, what we tend to do is get really heavy in one color, like maybe green and red, right? So when you make a salad, you have, of course have some greens and you might add some cucumbers, maybe celery, tomatoes, Maybe if you're really fancy, you add a pepper in there, but it might be a green pepper, right? When you're putting vegetables together, we've got to think, we've got to think color. So yes, we have greens, but you have reds, you have oranges, your yellows, your purples. That can make a salad look really nice when you put all of it together and very much appealing. So you want to get color and make sure that you're having one of your fruits and vegetables from every color of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, purples. And the whites being things like garlic, onions, you know, cauliflower. These are the healthy white foods, not the breads, right? So we want variety there with the rainbow. We're going to start, if you flip your page over, we're going to go side or step by step through this food process. Okay? So the first category of food that you see there are your fats and oils. Now all of these are these beneficial fats that we hear about. We do need fat. Don't have a misconception. Not all fat is created equal. So we're talking about things like your olive oil, flaxseed oil, um, you know, walnut oil is fantastic on salads if you haven't had that before. Um, but also things like olives and avocados. These are good, beneficial, healthy fats. Um, you can see there's dark chocolate on there. People are usually happy to see that. We don't want to indulge. We just want to have a little piece. But there are some good benefits to dark chocolate, and the fat content is one of them. Okay, so pay attention though to serving sizes. It's this is like most food we tend to overdo it. It says for oils, it's a teaspoon, not a tablespoon. Teaspoon. So you know part of this is you've got to bring out measuring cups and scales and utilize them. They are kitchen utensils the same way that your knife and fork are. They should be in your kitchen, they should always be readily available, and you should use them. 
If you have the fantastic ability that I admire of being able to eyeball things, more power to you. My brain doesn't work that way. If I don't measure, I have no clue what the size of it is. <laughs> so my measuring cup, my scale, all that stuff is always right there. And no matter how many times I make a salad, I still measure out my teaspoons of oil so I know what's going on in my salad. I don't try to eyeball it. Because usually when you do, what happens is too much oil comes out, <laughs> right? And so you want to you be paying attention to this because we don't want to overdo it. I have people who overeat healthy foods. And you're like, well, what do you mean overeat? It's still too many calories and they're trying to lose weight. They're just eating too much of the good stuff. So you might still have to do a calorie restriction. So this is part of it in paying attention to what serving sizes are. One of the other benefits to paying attention to serving sizes is it does help you when you can master this at home, it really helps you then when you are out in social environments because you don't get anything in serving sizes when you're out to eat or somebody's house or a party or anything like that. So when you can really get an idea at home, what does a serving size of chicken look like? You can go to the restaurant and make a much better decision on when to cut it off and say, I want to take the rest home and not overdo it and not blow all your effort. So get familiar with these serving sizes. Servings vary a bit. Okay, so minimum is going to be four servings a day, and it varies depending on what your calorie requirement is. So why don't I give you serving sizes based on a 1600 calorie plan, um, which would be an average plan for um, women. So Bob, I apologize, but we'll go with 1600. <laughs> Okay, so based on a 1600 calorie plan, your nuts, or excuse me, your fats, you would have five servings a day. Okay, so we'll start with that. Your nuts and seeds is the next category of foods. Remember, you can see the color coding there. You got orange and yellow because they're serving as protein and fat. But look at serving sizes. By the way, pumpkin seeds, that should say two tablespoons, not two pumpkin seeds. <laughs> um, I think it's fixed on there. Yeah. Yeah, it's just up here on my thing. You know, somebody pointed that. They were like, really, only two pumpkin seeds? Yep, only two. <laughs> two tablespoons. But here's the thing with nuts and seeds. There are a lot of health benefits beside, behind nuts in the seed family. But this is a scoop and toss food, I call it. Right? This is what we do. We scoop and we toss. And we scoop and we toss. And before you know it, a whole canister of nuts is gone. We have totally overdone it. We have gone from health benefit to health detriment. <laughs> okay, so this is the food category that I always tell people pre package. Pre package, pre package, pre package. Get yourself little Ziploc baggies, get yourself little Tupperware, whatever it is, and count out your serving size. This is an easy go to snack to have in your bag, to have in your car, to have at your office, to have wherever you may need that last minute snack so you don't end up running into the, uh, you know, 7 Eleven. Well, we don't have 7 Eleven, but, you know, fast track and picking up a, you know, Snickers bar because you're starving. Okay, now 12 almonds doesn't sound like a lot, does it? It is, it's a decent amount. Because the difference now, instead of scoop and toss, you will take one almond at a time and you will enjoy every last one of them. You will actually create this eating awareness because you're not going to scoop and toss. When you realize you only have 12 to eat, you're going to take your time eating them. And you know what? 12 almonds really cuts the edge off of you. If you're feeling a little hungry, 12 almonds will do it. It'll satisfy you for a little bit and it'll hold you over for a little bit. So just prepackage. Now I will say, just on a little side note, because sometimes people say it's so expensive eating healthy. No, don't buy the 100 calorie snack packs of almonds. That will be expensive. Buy it in bulk and prepackage them yourself. Okay? And that's really then not very expensive. Um, so typically you're going to have one, possibly two servings of this. So there's a couple leeways within the 1600 calorie. One to two servings. We move on to the next category of food, which is protein. 
And protein, what we mean by this, now remember there was protein in the nuts, and you're going to see protein come up again in when we talk about the bean category or legume family. But protein, what I mean here is that it's concentrated protein. So the essential uh, um, nutrient, macronutrient that you're getting from these foods is primarily protein. And we have things like in your first section there, your meats and poultries. Average serving size you see is three ounces. Measure three ounces of chicken. It is not the chicken breast that you buy that is like this big, right? Just because they're packaged that way doesn't mean that's a serving size. Three ounces is a serving size. And again, this is where I, I bring into the point. So many people think eating healthy is expensive. No, when you eat right portion sizes, it's not. Because now that package of chicken goes much longer. It, it lasts much longer when you're eating right portion sizes. Um, so about three ounces. If you like using protein powders, you're talking about one to two scoops depending on the protein powder, but you're looking somewhere at least a minimum of 15 grams of protein if you are using those, okay? Plant proteins, this includes things like tofu and tempeh, miso, if you like veggie burgers, if you're looking for alternatives with that. Um, and again, serving sizes vary a little bit. Um, and then some of the additional animal proteins that we talk about uh, include things like your cheeses and eggs. Um, this is one thing too, now keeping in mind that I'm not taking into account, if somebody has a dairy allergy, it doesn't mean you have to eat this stuff. Okay, you work within what your limitations may be. But things like cheese, cottage cheese, um, these are good sources of protein. They serve as excellent snacks for the in-between stages. Um, and again, if you think about hard cheese, one ounce of hard cheese, you know, it's not a ton, but it's a nice little snack. Cut up your block of cheese. Listen, I can cut up a block of cheese and I think I get like 10 or 11 servings out of it. I mean, that's a couple weeks and it's, I don't know, $5? It's not really an expensive snack at all. Um, eggs, two eggs would be a serving size. So you can see kind of the general rule of thumb is about three ounces here, but we have a variety of food. So it depends on which food you're picking. So it's getting familiar with it. Essentially, protein should be present at every meal. So you want between three and four servings of protein. Three to four of them. One of the big mistakes that a lot of people make is that we start breakfast off carbs, carbs, carbs. Breakfast should have protein. So whether you want to throw nuts into your oatmeal to get some protein, if you want to have a couple eggs, hard boil a bunch of them, you want to have some cheese as you walk out the door. <laughs> Pardon? Um, it depends. Still might not be enough protein there, um, but it will help to bring the content up. Um, as I said, the eggs, you can do obviously cottage cheese and some fruit and some nuts. That makes up a nice breakfast. Um, so you really should have protein present at breakfast. Protein is one of the things that helps make you feel fuller longer. You feel satisfied. Okay, so definitely breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're picking one of these proteins. Okay, now one of the things when it comes to cardiovascular disease and um, a recommendation that I always make for people is you want to stay lower on the inflammatory scale. So red meat is more inflammatory. So you really want to limit that red meat. I, depending on where somebody is, I a lot of times take it right away from them. No red meat until we get you under control, but if you're going to have it, you know, one time a week, if you really need to do that, you want to stick with your, you know, your chicken, your fishes, uh, turkey, over the red meat because of the inflammatory properties associated with those. So we move okay. on to the next category, which is non-starchy vegetables. I should also make mention, when you're looking on this sheet here, and you do see it here, you see that there's colored boxes, um, you know, within the categories. You can see that there's various colored boxes, like for instance here on the vegetables, um, the cruciferous family has been blocked off here in green. These foods that are in the boxes are also particularly good for detoxifying your body. 
So when you're looking at the food groups, now you can also say, you know what, I'm going to make sure I have more of these vegetables here because it also helps me detoxify. And when we're helping to detoxify the body, it means you're ridding it of things like pesticides or heavy metals or an excess fat and all these extra things that we're exposed to. And it really helps in providing some more balance. So just to give you some, some clues as you're picking from the foods, all of the foods on the list are good to pick, but if you really want to focus in hard, then you can pay attention even closer to the ones in the boxes, the colored boxes. So your non-starchy vegetables are always the unlimited category of food. Imagine that. You can have as many vegetables as you want. So if you're ever hungry, eat vegetables. <laughs> Now, you want to have at least five of these a day, minimum of five. And what constitutes a serving size? About a half a cup, with the exception of your green leafy vegetables, which is two cups. Now, just to measure out, if you were to take broccoli and get a half a cup of broccoli, I want everybody to just try it and see what it looks like. No, it's not a lot of broccoli. A half a cup of broccoli is like two spears. It's hardly anything. So if you have, you know, a, a, you know whatever you're going to have for dinner, a piece of fish, and maybe you do a half a sweet potato, and you could easily do a cup and a half of broccoli and get three servings of vegetables right there, and it's not that much. But reality is we still fall as a society very much short on vegetables fruits and vegetables. So get familiar. What does a half a cup look like? Of course, a half a cup of cucumbers is going to be a lot more than a half a cup of broccoli. So look, variety. <laughs> That's when you start adding all kinds of things together. I take my measuring cup in the morning when I'm making my salad. I usually do shredded um, pr you know, purple cabbage. I put celery and cucumbers and tomatoes and peppers and I just load it up until I get about a cup and a half. So I get three servings of vegetables with that, plus at least two cups or more of green leafies. I get four servings of vegetables just at lunchtime. And I'm always fascinated. How are people falling short? Because well, I forget that they're going through the drive through and that little piece of lettuce and tomato on top of the burger isn't counting for much. <laughs> right? Um, so there's some vegetables on here that you might be like, hmm, I've never really thought of that before. Like maybe bok choy. Maybe you've seen it and you just don't know what to do with it. Try it. There's no harm. Just buy it and try it. Worst case scenario, you lost a few bucks if you don't like it. Bok choy is fantastic, just stir fried up with anything. Um, or maybe something like uh, jicama. Has anybody ever had jicama? It's a Mexican root vegetable that you can cut up and really put in anything. It's got a nice little sweet flavor to it. Um, you know, sometimes they can be seasonal. You won't always find them in the grocery store, but you can eat it raw. You can cook it up. It's really a lovely vegetable. Um, adding just for some variety, you know, adding something like bean sprouts to your salad so you don't get bored with cucumbers and tomatoes. I have people say all the time, I'm sick of salads. Quit eating them. There's a million things you can do with vegetables. It doesn't have to be a salad. Make a stew, make a soup, put a stir fry together. Or try just different vegetables instead of just your traditional lettuce, cucumber, tomato salad. You can make all kinds of salads, put in different cabbages and sprouts and things like that together. So just, you know, sometimes you just got to think outside the box. Have fun when you're shopping for vegetables. Your legumes. Legumes are a carbohydrate as well as a protein. Now, I get a lot of people who say, I don't like beans, they make me gassy. I'm going to say, very frankly, get over it. <laughs> Your body will adjust. Most people get gassy from beans for um, one of two reasons. First, it always helps to soak them. Okay, that will help to release some of the gas from them. As well as, if you're not used to eating them, then your body does this very beautifully smart thing called ADAPT, <laughs> and it stops producing the enzymes that break beans down. So when you start having them again, your body gets the message, oh, wait a minute, we need these enzymes. And it will start re releasing them again and utilizing them again. But you might have to go through a couple days of some gas. 
you'll get over it, I promise. Won't be the end of the world. <laughs> Um, and they are a good source, obviously, of protein and um, carbohydrates, as well as fiber. Um, so you want to have um, one serving of legumes every day. When you're looking at things like hummus, hummus, a quarter cup of hummus is a lot when you measure it out. And you can do that with some cut up vegetables, and it's a great snack. Edamame is also a really fun snack if you are somebody who likes to do like the hand to mouth thing is maybe you're watching TV. Um, when you get edamame, which are soybeans in the pod, warm those up a little bit. You have to chew them out of the pod. So you can kind of, you know, it slows you down. So you can pick one, chew it out, chew them, get rid of the pod and move on. Um, and you can have a decent amount of those to, um, to serve as a, a fun snack as well. Basically, for me, beans can be added to anything. Any soup, any stew, anything that you're making, you can add beans to it and it will add some tremendous flavors. Your dairy and dairy alternatives, um, what this really constitutes is just milk and yogurts. And dairy alternatives meaning um, any of your um, plant-based dairy products. So things like rice milk, coconut milk, almond milk, uh, yogurts that are made from them. We can get a lot of this stuff now that we used to not be able to get. Um, so coconut milk yogurt is available. So if you're really trying to still just avoid animal dairy, you can get yogurts made that way. Um, sheep's milk um, and goat's milk are usually more tolerable for somebody who has a lactose issue if you're looking for alternatives. And Greek yogurt, Typically, because of the fermentation process that Greek yogurt goes through, if you are lactose intolerant, most people can handle Greek yogurt, as well as things like hard cheeses. Um, so, you know, the, your aged cheeses, like cheddar cheese, most people that are lactose intolerant can handle that. Um, so you want to have one of these a day. Your starchy vegetables. Um, your starchy vegetables are your root vegetables. It's all the vegetables growing in the ground. So things like corn, uh, excuse me, carrots and squashes, potatoes. Um, these naturally have more sugar content to them. So they naturally by default have more calories to them. You know, potato certainly has more calories than celery, right? So we want to do a limitation here of just one serving of these vegetables. Just one. So keeping in mind you're getting at least five of the other, and this one gives you up to six vegetables just right there. And pay attention too, because you know, just like chicken comes in these enormous things, sweet potatoes now are like, I mean, I've seen some sweet potatoes that are just, I mean, I don't even know what they do to them, right? But a sweet potato really is like, they're tiny, so it's a half a cup. It's not meant to be this big gargantuan thing. Um, you know, a sweet potato in that size can really send your blood sugar through the roof <laughs> because of the sugar content in them. So caution, um, paying attention to those serving sizes. Um, you know, about a cup, so a small sweet potato or a small half of a baked potato. Um, and I utilize these too just in ter terms of thinking when you're out to eat at a restaurant. Baked potato is almost always an option. Most restaurants offer that. So you know that you can get a baked potato, split it, you know, cut it in half, don't plan on eating the whole thing, and there's your starchy vegetable. And you have foregone the, the grain side of it. You know, and you have another vegetable and fruit, uh, not fruit, but, um, you know, poultry or fish or what have you. So one of those a day. Your fruits. Fruits vary in serving sizes as well. Um, so it's getting familiar. I'm a volume girl. I much rather have a cup of blueberries than 15 grapes. It just isn't just not. It's just more appealing. <laughs> 15 grapes isn't a lot, but that's what a serving size is. However, I will say if you're starting to package them up and pre-package, you know the little tiny snack bags, Ziploc bags, not the sandwich bags, but the snack ones. If you fill a snack bag with grapes, that's about a serving size, and it's not a bad little snack to have. But, you know, a cup of berries is just much more appealing to me. <laughs> um, but you want to have two fruits a day. Only two. Now, careful with um, overdoing the fruits. A lot of people will overdo the fruits. And keeping in mind, it's still sugar. 
So this might be the thing that throws your blood sugar off and your insulin off, which can then lead down the road to, to cardiovascular concerns, right? So only two a day. So now between your two fruits, your one starchy, and five of your others, you have eight servings of fruits and vegetables. Try it and see what happens. You are going to be very satisfied. You're going to find that cravings and you know, surges of hunger are going to disappear when you're eating in this fashion just by getting that, because it's a tremendous amount of nutrient-dense food. Okay, so one of the things to keep in mind here is that not all calories are created equal, right? You could take 100 calories of almonds or a 100-calorie snack pack of cookies, and nutrient-wise, it's two different things that go on in the body, right? I mean, the density of the food and what you're actually getting are two different things. Calorie for calorie, the same, but nutrient density-wise is not. When you start eating in this fashion here and what's on this plan, you're going to find what I have most people say to me, I can't get it all in because I'm just not hungry. I'm still full from my last meal. I'm very satisfied. I don't have a craving for anything because I'm eating all the time. <laughs> These are common responses. Yeah? Um, tangerine, mm -hmm. SL, two slices? Tangerine. Two SL. Oh, no, oh, you know what? That should be too small. Too small. Yep. Okay. Good catch. It's amazing how many times we've had these and how many eyes have been on these things and we still catch things. So that should be two small tangerines. Grains is your last category of food. Now this is the category of food that the average person overdoes. And when we have too many grains, we miss out on all of the other food groups. So you have one grain per day. Oh, 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 that just gave me a heart attack. <laughs> one grain a day. We overdo this category. And, in, and as a result, we miss out on other things. Okay? I'm going for the popcorn with three cups. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is, let's just take cereal as the example. You start the day off with cereal and milk. We have no protein. Right? Yeah, other than that little bit of milk but we have no protein added in there. No fat, really. Right, so basically you start off your day on a carbohydrate high. You're gonna come crashing pretty soon because we've, we've, we've um, really put a spike into our blood sugar and haven't followed it up with the fat or carbo uh, uh, the protein. So um, grains to me get utilized more in terms of if you wanna have it at lunchtime or dinner time. Um, if you do have it at breakfast, though, then we just need to modify. Let's say you take a cereal like oatmeal or buckwheat. You add nuts to it. You could cook it up with milk as well if you want to use your dairy there. You can add some fruit to it if you want to have a fruit there. And you start making a more nutrient-dense breakfast rather than just a carbohydrate overload. Okay? What yeah. about the, the cereals that claim um, Right. Um, so that would be a better choice. Okay. Um, but when we want protein, so that's just been added in. Right. You know, you the, have... right. You rather have the real deal protein. So they've added it in. Um, you know, they've fortified and enriched foods, essentially, is what they've done. Um, some of the kashis, part of the protein comes from the fact that they have nuts in them. So if you pay attention to that, though, some of those cereals can be like 250 yeah. calories for like a half a cup of serving. I can get you way more food for 250 calories. I'll just put in perspective what I could get you for 250 calories. You ready? You could have three ounces of chicken, a half a cup of rice, a salad with some oil and vinegar, and another side of vegetables for 250 calories. No, but I'm just saying to put in perspective. Versus a bowl of cereal that you really, in a, you know, a couple hours, you're going to be searching for some food. Okay? Versus having a real nutrient-dense breakfast. So just a little caution with that. 
Um, I do find that most people, once they start cutting back on the grains, they realize how much they've overdone it. And I have a lot of people who cut out grains completely because they kind of go, eh, there's no space for it. You know, for, for just to take as examples in, in my home, um, sweet potatoes are the, the staple starch, if you will. Not rice, not, you know, pastas. Bread is non-existent in my house. It's just not there. Um, so really, dinner is always a protein and vegetables. You know, starchy, non-starchy, and protein. There's almost no place in my family to, to put the grain. Because at lunchtime, we're talking about doing salads or soups or stews like that because you want more vegetables still, and we need a protein. There's nowhere to have a sandwich, you know, where you would utilize bread or something like that. So it actually, as you start really incorporating whole foods that are nutrient-dense, as we're talking about, grains kind of, kind of, you know, a lot of people just go, yeah, yeah, I don't really have them. That's a food category that I miss out on because I just don't need it. So you'll be surprised as you get going. The other thing to note on here is that the asterisk means that those are gluten-free grains. So if you're looking to be a gluten-free person, um, you can start with some of the very basics of rice. That's a naturally gluten-free food. Okay, so you start with something like that. Quinoa, by far, has to be my favorite gluten-free grain. This guy here. It is a complete protein. That's why I like it. So normally with, um, you know, for instance, if, if you were to look at the amino acid profile, everybody knows rice and beans is what makes a complete protein. You've got to have those two together to get all your amino acids. Where you have quinoa by itself and you're good. You don't need to pair it with beans. You pair it with beans, it's even better. Right? But, but quinoa is a great food for that reason. A lot of nutrient value to that. So after all of that talk about all these risk factors and all of that, what it really comes down to is real eating. Balanced eating and understanding the food choices that you have. Give it a try. Measure your foods. See how you do with it. See how long before cravings for sugar disappear. I find on average about two days. If you're a sugar addict, for two days you might go through a little withdrawal, maybe a little headache, but afterwards you're going to be over it in two days when you get this nutrient-dense food going on. Now another one of your handouts really focuses in on your top heart-healthy foods. I think it's right towards the back. Yep. And it's everything that you see up here. But these are some of your top heart-healthy foods. And what I did on your um, handout is talk about, for instance, with salmon. One of the reasons why it's beneficial for your heart health is that it's very rich in omega-3s. These are your good essential fatty acids. Flax seeds, you can see your omega-3s as well as fiber and what's called phytoestrogens, which are very beneficial to not only cardiovascular health but hormonal health. Um, your oatmeal. You got omega-3s, but you got magnesium, potassium, folate, niacin, calcium, and fiber. So you start getting more bang for your buck there, right? It's really loaded with a lot of things. Your black and kidney beans have things like your B-complex um, of vitamins, magnesium, fiber, omega-3s again. So you can just start to see where some of these foods are good and what they're good for. So, you know, you have salmon a couple times a week. You're going to have beans, so utilize black or kidney beans where possible. Have your almonds and walnuts as snacks. Make sure you get some broccoli in. Have some brown rice, blueberries. Make a salad that has spinach and carrots and red bell peppers and tomatoes. Um, maybe have a little soy milk instead of almond milk. And, most importantly, end your day with a glass of red wine. <laughs> Right? One of the big heart healthy foods there. And don't forget the chocolate. Dark chocolate is beneficial. Now the key is one little ounce. You know, it's like one little dove square. And here's one of the little keys with, with dark chocolate. If you are having a chocolate craving or a sugar craving of sorts, what you do is you take that little dark dove chocolate and do not chew it but you let it melt in your mouth, okay? 
this works because now we get it absorbed orally rather than going through the digestive tract and it gets to your brain really quickly that tells your brain to calm down and it stops that sugar or chocolate craving. You don't have to get through a whole pound bag of M&Ms to go through the digestive tract before the message gets to the brain. You just need one little Dove chocolate and it will get there really quickly. That's a good idea. I never thought of that. I think I'll try that. That's a good idea. But so it really just helps in, in, from that process. So balanced eating, when it comes down to it, it's high fruits, high vegetables, lean protein, high quality fats, high fiber, low sugar, low gluten, plant-based dairy if you can, and organic if possible. Right? This isn't the first time you've probably heard this message, right? We just need to do it. We need to implement it. So one of the, a few things, things here, with calorie restriction, one of the things that it does is it decreases oxidative stress. So it decreases your um, rusting by not overeating calories. It also decreases inflammation and that autoimmune dysfunction that can go on. But one of the things that it does is also increase mitochondrial numbers. So automatically you're going to have more energy. And a lot of people think, well, if I reduce my calories, I'm going to have no energy. No, you're going to have more. <laughs> especially when we're doing it in this healthy fashion. So some of those benefits there. Um, tips for just overcoming some of your cravings. Um, definitely, we talked about this already, eating protein at breakfast. Having small frequent meals throughout the day. Um, not drinking your calories. You'll get much more satisfaction out of eating an apple than having a glass of apple juice. Your body will like that much better. Um, paying attention to potential food allergies that can create or trigger those cravings. For instance, a lot of times people have a food allergy to gluten and the very thing they crave is gluten. You have an allergy to dairy and the very thing you crave is dairy. Okay, This is a, a phenomenon that's, that's kind of known as your body is really, really trying to protect, it, protect, it, protect itself because basically dealing with the allergy is easier than dealing with the um, side effects that are going to happen when you take it away. So it's this weird little concept that can go on. So a lot of times if you're craving one particular food, that might be truly a food allergy for you, which can, you know, obviously just then spin into multiple cravings. Everybody's heard you got to get sleep, right? Is everybody getting seven, eight hours of sleep? I hope so. It's so important. I feel so bad for people who don't sleep. It's such a beautiful thing. It really is. If you're not getting it, you've got to try hard. You've got to find a way to get that in. Um, and having that nutrient-dense food plan that we just talked about is definitely going to just help you overcome the cravings because you're not going to be, you don't become that scavenger. Like, you know, that had their blood sugar crash and you get home, you're just like, oh my God, what's in the cabinets? I'll take anything, right? I've had people say, I've opened up bags of semi-sweet chocolate chips because I just wanted something. Yeah, you know? Like, oh, they're sprinkles. Let me eat those. Oh, you know? Because <laughs> it was there. <laughs> when you're eating regularly um, and, and high nutrient foods, then you don't have to worry about it. Yes? I did tell you to, and that's what I'm sticking with. This is a plan that can go up to, this are some guidelines that were actually taken from Mark Houston again. And up to, f up to four, meaning that we might deal with somebody who needs up to maybe 2,500 calories. Okay. Right? So I gave you kind of that ideal based on where the average person is going to fall. Um, and again, some of his things, one of the things, when you're eating the way that we just talked about, you don't really have to pay attention to how much fiber you're getting, because by default, you're going to get more than 25 grams of of fiber just in that food plan but that's that's the number obviously you're paying attention so no trans fat it's not in the food there because you're not eating processed foods so you don't need to worry about it you're getting high quality protein because that's what we talked about right so these are some of his guidelines and that's exactly what's just laid out here so it happens by default don't have to pay attention to those really because it's there I just want to show you some of the effects that things can have. When you look just at knots, it can decrease your coronary heart disease by 30%. Vegetables, 23%. Fruits, 20%. 
Um, your omega-3 is 14%. Look at the Mediterranean diet, 37%. But look what happens, Western diet, can you see that one down there? It increases it by 55%. So just making changes in that diet can help tremendously um, with what's going on. Now, not, without going into a lot of detail, we need to move. Bottom line, move, 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 move. Really, the general guideline is 10,000 steps a day. And a day means, you have a little pedometer on? Good for you. A day means Monday through Sunday. You know, it doesn't, the, our days don't last just Monday through Friday. You should be walking daily. You should be moving daily. By, by nature, we, were a, we are a people, a being, that's meant to be in motion. We are just sitting around between our jobs, our school, you know, things like that, TV, all of that sort of stuff. We sit more than we ever did. We should be moving. 10,000 steps is really the equivalent of just being an active human being. If you are active, you don't really need to count your steps, right? Somebody like myself, I'm in an office all day or I'm standing here. You see I pace, you know, and I'm not pacing as much because I know Matt's got the video camera on me. Otherwise, I'd be pacing more <laughs> because I, I need to move because otherwise I'm sitting too much. That drives me berserk. I get home, I'm standing around my living room because I don't want to sit down. I've been sitting all day. Um, you know, if you have an animal at home, Take them for a walk, right? That's part of the joy of them, is that you get to take them for a walk. So it gets you active as well. At a very minimal, though, 30 minutes a day, five days a week of just getting out and moving. Just start something. One of the biggest things when it comes to exercise is having a routine. If you don't have a routine, it's going to become a chore. It's a task. You don't want to do it. It's another thing on your to-do list. So if you pick a time or you pick a you know, class that you want to go to or anything like that, it's having the routine of it. You put it in your calendar, you make it an appointment, you don't schedule anything out at that, else at that time. Right? Now, if being realistic, if getting up at 5.30 is never going to work for you, then don't plan it then because you'll just be very disappointed with yourself and mad when you don't hit that. <laughs> You know, so if 9 o'clock is realistic, then schedule it at 9 o'clock and don't make an appointment to go see your doctor at 9 o'clock because that is your time, right? That is some of the biggest tips, really, when it comes to that, if you are engaging in regular activity. So it becomes very important. When we're talking about strength training, that helps us build muscle. Remember, one of the muscles we have in our body is our heart. It is a muscle. If we are building muscle in general, we are helping our heart. It also helps us burn fat more effectively. So you can get rid of fat by building muscle. And of course, improving flexibility is always a good thing too, keep you nice and limber and able to move around. Let's talk just a little bit about stress. You have been in my class before, have seen some of this, but I can't talk about cardiovascular disease without talking about stress because it contributes, bottom line. And when it comes to stress is you can never escape it. We're always going to have it. It's how we deal with it that becomes important. So everybody saw this one before. This is one of my favorites. Stress is dessert spelled backwards. This is how most people respond to stress is we eat something. We crave something like the chocolate cake, right? These are a couple things. This is from an, another woman that's really, really neat to check out and follow is Mimi Guarnieri, Guar Guar I forget how to say her name. Um, she is a cardiologist that did some very unbelievable work. Um, basically, she was a very standard cardiologist doing a lot of surgeries. She was known as the stent doctor, actually. She just put in stents left and right. And she was approached by um, her facility saying, you know, we'd like to try something. Um, it's called lifestyle medicine, where you, people eat right, and they engage in exercise, and they manage stress. And she's like, do you know who I am? <laughs> do you know what I do? Are you sure you want me heading this up? And they said, yes, we think you're the right person. And she headed up this, this pilot program of looking at the food that we talked about, managing stress. She started doing some regular guided imagery with people and yoga classes and things like that. 
and making sure they exercised. And she is a cardiologist now that does not prescribe drugs nor surgery. Her entire practice is based on food, exercise, and stress management, which is the core to the first line therapy program and essentially the core to my practice. Her entire cardiology practice, and she is an MD, is based on this. How cool is that? So doctors who think around here that can't, it can't be done, oh, it can be done. Um, so this, these were a couple of her slides, I, and I, I just really like them from a stress standpoint. Suffering happens between the ears. Everything else is just a situation. We are our own worst enemy when it comes to stress. We make up situations like we can't even believe. We make things worse than they need to be. We worry about things left and right, right? I had a little computer glitch. I was having some issues with the presentation earlier, and I'm like, seriously? And I was missing some slides. I don't know where they went. You know, in between clients, and then, I, then I'm putting this together, and I forgot some handouts, and I'm like, you know, you have that little temporary moment, and I went, really? What's the big deal? Are any of you going to know if I was missing a slide today? No. Nope. <laughs> right? So we, were, we get all stressed out over situations that a lot of time really have no um, bearing. And Mark, Mark Twain, I like this one too, I've suffered a many great misfortunes, most of which never happened. We do this a lot too whether it's at work or with a family member or a significant other or anything like that, that concept of fear, right? False evidence appearing real. This is a big contributor to stress. Now, I do not pretend by any means that stress is not going to be in our lives. It's going to be. But how we manage it is the difference. And it's easy to say stress management and you should embark on some breathing techniques and you should do some guided imagery or you should journal or whatever it may be. But reality is it's a practice and it takes time and we have to remember to take that time for ourselves. So stress management definitely is a um, factor. We talked about these before as well, so just briefly to go through. Um, stress essentially is accounting for about two thirds of all family physician um, visits, stress related symptoms. So it might be something like high blood pressure, heart palpitations, inability to sleep, a migraine headache, getting a flu or cold more often than the average because you're stressed out. So there's really not many diseases out there that don't have a connection to this. Um, and certainly a lot of people are feeling it at their jobs. They're feeling the pressure there. They're feeling the demands, especially women. Not, not that it doesn't happen for men too. But now you have to be super mom, super wife, super boss, super employee, super PTA person, super everything. You know, it's, it's the days of just being able to stay home and take care of your family are gone, <laughs> right? And there's so many demands, and it really contributes to the overall stress factor. When it comes to stress in the heart, there is no doubt there is a huge connection. Huge, huge connection. At the end of the day, your heart is a big bundle of electromagnetic field going on, right? The way, one of the ways we measure the heart is an EKG, right? looking at the electricity that's going on in the heart. So the heart really sends out very strong messages. And it gets very much affected by stress because it can take in those messages too because it's this big bundle of energy, right? Do you take on other people's problems? Anybody do that? You feel their pain? You know, somebody complains to you about their day and you're like, oh man, I wish I could take it on for you. You know, we do this. I do this in practice all the time. Listen, I go home and I feel people, I, I feel stuff that goes on for people because I have to be open to you in order to help you. But in turn, I'm also letting you into my space and I take on your stuff. It's a really interesting dynamic that happens for people like myself and others that are in this field because we have to learn to put up that shield so I don't come home with all of your stress. Right? This happens. A lot of people do this in various jobs. Think about social workers and teachers and things like that. We take on other people's issues because of this big electromagnetic field that we have. Forgiveness is also a big piece. I can't stress this one enough. Um, Forgive for Good is a fantastic book. 
Um, if you are holding a piece of something in your life, grudge towards somebody, something. Um, cardiovascular disease and forgiveness. Persons, the, and these are quotes from in, uh, the Internal Journal of Behaviors, displayed more rapid diastolic and mean arterial blood pressure recovery than persons low in forgiveness. So essentially, if you are a more forgiving person, you have lower blood pressure. How cool is that? That's a pretty good one. Higher levels of forgiveness were associated with lower levels of anxiety, depression, and perceived stress, as well as lower cholesterol. HDL and LDL ratios were controlled for their age and gender. You can lower your cholesterol by forgiving somebody you're mad at. How cool is that? This is some of the things we talk about with stress. Holding a grudge, if you've ever held one, can be very demanding on you. So stress management. Find some time every day to do something. Something that is contributing to the better management of your stress. It could be something like guided imagery, which there's a lot of fantastic CDs out there for that. Um, Bernie Siegel is one of my favorites. Um, you could do some meditation. You could take a yoga class. You could take a hot bubble bath. You could write in a journal. You can turn off everything around you and just sit in peace and quiet for five minutes. You could take a five-minute snappy-nappy at lunch. That's what my father calls them. They live in Florida, and they take snappy-nappies down there. <laughs> so it's finding the time, and it doesn't have to be long. As little as five minutes, if you want to sit there for 30 minutes, it doesn't matter. But it's, again, that consistency to it. So when you have a stressful moment, you are more well-equipped to deal with it. Now, I know we're running low on time. Let's see. About 15 minutes, we're good. Possible supplements. I'm going to go through a list I don't want you writing down frantically, okay? Because I do have what my suggestions are. But there is a lot out there when it comes to possibility of supplements. But you should always make sure you know what you're doing with supplements before you run out there and get them. Not all supplements are good, depending on what medications you're on, depending on what's going on with you. You don't need to overdose on these things, and we don't necessarily need all of these things. These are just some of the guidelines and some of the things that you may hear that are beneficial for cardiovascular disease. Um, carnosine, which is an amino acid, especially helpful when it comes to things like high blood pressure. Vitamin E, which is an antioxidant. So what are we doing? We're helping that oxidative stress and bringing that rusting down, right? Lipoic acid can help with a variety of things, um, including balancing blood sugar, um, another antioxidant. N-acetylcysteine is what NAC is. Um, this is an amine, uh, excuse me, uh, antioxidant again. Niacin. Niacin, has anybody heard of niacin for lowering cholesterol? Some people take niacin and they get that very fun thing called the niacin flush. They get really hot from taking niacin. This is one of those things where you want to be careful. There's different forms of niacin out there, and niacin might not be appropriate for you for this reason. Um, L-arginine is another amino acid that is great for lowering blood pressure. Garlic. Garlic not only helps with cardiovascular, when we're talking about just real deal, like take the garlic, cook with it, eat it, or you could take a supplement. Um, but it's also great antibacterial and microbial. It will kill just about anything. Really, really great for those. Omega-3s are your fish oils. And you can see dosing here is much higher. Wow. Hi there. Everybody can still see, right? Um, I wonder if, is there a, there is a little delay there. Um, your omega-3s, um, higher doses of that. This is great anti-inflammatory. So anytime there's inflammation present, your omega-3s are going to be beneficial. Vitamin C, another antioxidant. Um, B-complex, good for a variety of things, including the mitochondrial and the oxidative stress and helping with energy. CoQ10 is a, a very essential one. If you are on a statin, you should be taking CoQ10. 
200 milligrams or more, you can write that one down. If you are currently on a statin, you should get on CoQ10. 200 milligrams or more. I will warn you, CoQ10 is an expensive supplement, so don't be shocked at the sticker. Okay? And there's varying doses. You will see a low dose like 30 milligrams. I'm talking you need 200. So make sure when you're looking for it, you're getting that higher dose. Um, green tea, or that EGCG, helps with decreasing the cholesterol absorption overall. Vitamin D we talked about is the antioxidant. It's helping from the oxidative stress. It's talk, helping with thyroid. It's helping with cholesterol. It's helping with blood sugar. It's helping with everything. Magnesium, very important. Resveratrol, that's what's found in your red wine. So some of this stuff, what starts to happen just as a, uh, while these might be supplements that are beneficial, when you start eating like this, you need less supplementation. Because guess what? You're going to get decent amounts of vitamin C. Maybe not quite to the 2,000 mark. Um, you're going to get enough Bs for the most part. You're going to do pretty well with magnesium. If you like a red glass of wine, guess what? You don't need to take resveratrol as a supplement. Okay? Niacin, when it comes to the niacin, you always start with lower dose and work your way up. It should always be taken with food. You avoid the red wine at this point um, to make sure you don't get that niacin flush. Um, plant sterols are another one. You might have heard some of this. I'm hearing it on commercials for some of the supplements out there on TV. Um, plant sterols are very effective at lowering cholesterol. Is that the red wine that you said? No, it's a little different. Um, I personally don't find a lot of success with red rice yeast. That's what I was told. Yeah. Even though there's some decent research behind it, I just don't see the numbers move the way that I would like to see them. So I don't use that. Um, plant sterile is much more effective. Niacin, much more effective. A B complex will be, I have just found to be much more effective. Um, flaxseed and curcumin, these are two other things too. Flaxseed, just use them. Use flaxseed oil. Put flaxseed on your yogurt. Don't you have to grind it like You should. Yeah. <clears throat> Curcumin is, um, you know, that spicy um, turmeric spice that can get used in Indian foods. Um, great anti-inflammatory. This is my protocol that I use along with diet and exercise. I use a, a formula called Ultra Meal Plus 360, and I actually left brochures up there for you. For somebody initially starting off, it's two servings a day for 12 weeks. This is a basic protocol for a 12-week time frame. Most doctors will go along with this because Ultra Meal Plus 360 is an FDA-approved medical food, meaning you can take Ultra Meal Plus 360 and it is documented and researched to lower your cholesterol and diabetes risks in that 12-week time period without prescriptions. And the FDA actually said, this is accurate. Now, I don't put a whole lot of faith in the FDA because they make a lot of mistakes. But I, I do give them some credit with this because the FDA does not look at anything in the nutraceutical industry and give credit to any of it. You know, all of your supplements will say, you know, it has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration, right? But this is one that has been. Ultimately, what um, makes up Ultra Meal Plus 360 is you have a very full complex of all of the antioxidants, anti-inflammatory um, anti properties to it. So you're getting higher doses of things like your B and your A and C and E and all of those sort of things. You're getting your two grams of plant sterols in there. You're also getting a blend of protein, carbs, and fat. So it's serving as a meal so it can help you eating often. Um, and the changes that have been documented with this in 12 weeks, I have seen somebody, not somebody, I've seen many people reverse their diabetes prognosis in 12 weeks without a medication. They can no longer be classified as a diabetic at the end of 12 weeks with this. And of course, all of your other risk factors come down. Your cholesterol, your blood pressure, triglycerides, all of that sort of stuff in conjunction. So this is my personal protocol. Um, EPA, DHA, or your fish oil, three grams or more per day. Vitamin D at 5,000 units a day. 
CoQ10 at 200 milligrams per day. And then you cook with garlic. Supplement if you don't like cooking with garlic, but I encourage you to cook with garlic rather than take the supplement. I encourage you to drink green tea instead of coffee. You will still get your caffeine if that's what you're worried about losing, but you get the benefits of the antioxidants in the green tea. You have one glass, four ounces of red wine. I say at the end of your day, but heck, if you need it to start your day, go for it. <laughs> have it where you want it. <laughs> Using those anti-inflammatory herbs like turmeric and rosemary and ginger. So when you're cooking, these have anti-inflammatory properties to them. You have your piece of dark chocolate, and I see you in 12 weeks. Well, usually I don't leave anybody out there for 12 weeks, but we reevaluate in 12 weeks. And we look and see where all those markers are. And in 12 weeks, I expect to see some big changes. So this is kind of the basics. You could get into all boatloads of supplements, but I don't agree with that if, you know, you're going to go take a boatload of, of drugs. It's no different when you're taking the boatload of supplements. I had somebody come in who literally had a page, page of things she was taking. And I said, the first thing we need to do is condense this. I don't even know what's working for you. It's impossible to know with that long of a list. Some of the other things, of course, these are some of the tips that are on your sheet there. Obviously, if you smoke, stop. We want to get some weight loss, um, decreasing stress, and things like this. And your numbers to know, this is the very, I think it was your last sheet, second to last sheet. Or our third to last sheet, it's in there somewhere. Your numbers to know. So let's just go through this list quickly and then I'm going to get you out of here. Total cholesterol, your ideal numbers in my opinion should be 160 to 200. Okay, your HDL greater than 50, your LDL under 100, your triglycerides under 150. Your take your triglyceride HDL ratio that we talked about less than 0.3 or excuse me, less than 3.0. Your HSCRP, high sensitive, high sensitivity C reactive protein, is what this test is. This is a marker of inflammation. You want to know this number. You want to know how inflamed you are so you know how much work you need to get done. That number should be less than 0.7. Is this a routine test? Um, it's not, unfortunately. It should be. Doctors who do it, do it routinely, but if your doctor doesn't do it, then he routine, routinely does not. <laughs> but it's an, easy, it's an easy one to do. Homocysteine. Homocysteine is also another marker of cardiovascular health. This is a protein that's important for many different things, but elevated homocysteine carries the risk factors that um, really translate higher than total cholesterol would. So homocysteine, you should know that, and it should be less than 7. If your homocysteine is elevated, you have a very good chance that you are also deficient in B12 and folic acid. Okay? So if that is elevated over 7, chances are you're also deficient in folic acid and B12. So you might want to supplement with that. Apolipoprotein B to A1. Remember we talked about those. Those are some of those particle sizes. You want to know what that ratio is, and that should be less than 0 0.6. I included in here also your ferritin level, which is your iron stores. You should know this for many levels, not just cardiovascular, but you should know this for things like your hormones, your thyroid. Um, ideal is 7 to, 70 to 90. Fasting glucose is also 70 to 90. 90 can really start hitting dangerous, though. Start really start having some issues there. Fasting insulin should be between 4 and 5. Your hemoglobin A1C, this is a marker of how well you use glucose overall or over a period of time. So fasting glucose is just looking at that snapshot right then and there. Hemoglobin A1C looks over a period of months in how your body's using glucose. Um, that should be less than 5.5. So fasting glucose isn't enough when we're talking about, are you insulin resistant? Are you diabetic? Are you pre-diabetic? You need your glucose, your insulin, and your hemoglobin to really get the accurate picture. Vitamin D level should be between a 50 and 80. 
I've seen single digits in this area. People feel pretty, pretty yucky that way. Blood pressure, I put down the new revised version of 110 over 70. I'm really okay with 120 over 80, just so you know. Your body fat, this really varies based on age and sex, so I can't really put ranges down there, but you should know what it is. And that waist to hip ratio that we talked about, for women less than 0.8 and for men 1.0 and less. So those are numbers that you should know. And let's just very briefly, and I'll open it up for questions, um, in your packet, I also included several forms there that show significant food sources of, you have B12, you have vitamin C, you have vitamin D, vitamin E, sources of calcium, potassium, magnesium, foods that combat high blood pressure, okay? So you can start to see where you eat the right blend of foods, you have less of a need for supplements. It is a very, very basic food first concept. And you will see there's some commonalities between um, something like spinach will show up multiple times. Your beans show up multiple times. Um, when you look at combat foods that combat high blood pressure, one of the nice little tricks, seriously, four stalks of celery a day. How simple is that? Oh, no, not at all. It's all water. It's what you think you need, though. It's what you do need. Salt, salt is true sodium. I'm sorry. Salary is true sodium. That's what the body really needs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you have a sheet there on stress management. Um, also, the next one is knowing your cardiovascular, uh, your risk for cardiovascular disease. And what I really like down on the bottom there is where we talked about the um, lipid size the lipid, lipid pan, pattern size, so the density of them, just so you have something to reference. And then, of course, your numbers to know and your tip, top heart healthy foods, and then my upcoming classes in addition that are also being offered here. So with that being said, I want to thank everybody for coming again and certainly open it up for Questions. Well, and also we have a challenge here in New York State because there's a lot of things we can't test, so we get very partial pictures, and so we can only work within the levels that we have. I am one that, yes, I work with labs, but my training has been in the fashion of I just prepare myself not to have them. So I look at the signs and symptoms, and I treat the person, not the lab. I mean, the lab will only get you so much information. I've had many people who come back with all normal labs and they feel like absolute garbage. So in which case those labs mean nothing because the person who's coming to me has the real issue. They don't feel well. And labs are not revealing anything because maybe we just haven't looked at the right thing. So, you know, labs, it's one of the tools. It's one of the tools. It's really looking and digging into what's going on with the person and make sure that you're focused in on treating the person, not the number. I mean, traditional medicine does a fine job of that. That's not what I'm looking to do. So it really gets into more signs and symptoms and what's going on and how do I make you feel better. And it might not be, it's, it might not really be the lab value that's going to tell us that. So a lot of, lot of, lot of stuff there. Yes. Can you tell us the, the books again? Yes, the first one is what your doctor may not tell you about heart disease, which is uh, Mark Houston. If you just even Google him, he really has done some fantastic work. And the other one is The Heart Speaks. Um, Mimi, and her last name is spelled G-U-A-R-N-E-R-I. And definitely check her out. Just check out her story if you would search for her on the internet and really see she's, pardon? Mimi, M-I-M-I, -M -I -M -I. yep. Um, you know, the Scripps Clinic there where she's just practicing all of this lifestyle stuff and no more surgery, it's really quite fascinating. She's really a very neat woman, yep. So thanks for coming. Thank Hopefully we'll see you at some more classes.